County Administrator, Dr. Joe Casey. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the sense of uh, regionalism. We got a lot of great news to cover today, so I'm going to just uh, jump right in. Uh, one of the things I really respect with the region is together today, we have the multiple business associations of Chesterfield County, Chamber RVA, Chester Business Association, Midlothian Business Alliance, and Southport, which together are, are forming even a stronger partnership. So it's, the, it's a family affair of all business here today in Chesterfield County. Um, in the spirit of real regional cooperation, I know many of you attended the Henrico State of the County. Just a quick show of hands who may have went there a week or two ago. So again, as you remember, my friend uh, John Batokas, and I talked to him with all the time, and we, we joke back and forth with each other. You know, he talked about his moonshot moment of what they're doing in, in Chesterfield, and in Henrico, that is, and I, uh, I joked with him. I said, that's, that's so 1969, John. You know, uh, uh, we're going to Mars. In, in Chesterfield. And as Bud Aldrin said, Mars is there waiting to be reached. So, uh, and Bud also said to him, it's easier to get there if we're working together in the region on that. So it's been a great year, year here today together. Collectively, we have accomplished many great things. And again, I'm really looking forward to 2020. The picture you see on the screen of our, our airport is an example. These large planes that are coming uh, and new planes that are coming to our airport in the business-friendly atmosphere that's around there and the surrounding areas uh, is just something to behold. And, and again, what I also see is a tax base growing from such ventures. So who are we? Just a quick reminder of the core functions of what local government is. You know, we are education, public safety, and infrastructure. That's what we do well. That's what you want us to do well each and every day. That's what you want to hold us accountable to do each and every day. So we wake up trying to do all of those things for you each and every day. Everything else that we do, everything else we talk about, if we don't mention those three things first, is not our priorities. It's important, they may be essential to certain populations, they may be necessities in other areas of our county, but as far as the core critical services, you know, we're getting put into positions more and more with those that are displeased with federal and state uh, politicians, uh, actions, and so forth, their laws and behaviors. So we are local, whether we like it or not, we are the child to the parent state, and we're the grandchild to the federal. We follow their laws, and we fund their unfunded mandates, regardless of what you, I, or elected officials may think. It's always been that way, even though I think we've grown from the child to the adult. And I also think that as the adult that we are, in many cases, we're actually more mature than our parents and grandparents. Um, that's enough of my political soapbox on that. I'm just a county administrator. Uh, we are thankful for our dedication of service and leadership, and uh, again, as uh, uh, Danielle rightfully did so, that the thankfulness that she gave to both Dorothy Jekyll and Steve uh, Ellswick. Uh, for those that don't know, when I applied in July 2016, they were the chair and vice chair of the Board of Supervisors and really remained in those roles for, for 2016, 17, and 18. So, uh, and I will say, you know, I came to Chesterfield County because of its great workforce, uh, because many of their plans and strategies and ideals of local government were aligned with my own, which makes your job easier but I also became because of those five board members that were there. Uh, it was early in their term, and, and when I was leaving Henrico County, many people, and I, I repeat, many people, businesses, citizens, other professionals in my uh, career, said you are going to a good board. And again, I wanna thank Dorothy for being part of that, that exercise. Um, as an example of our great workforce, though, before I leave the workforce, for those that don't know, you know we were one of only two local government agencies ranked amongst the Virginia companies on Forbes' list of best in-state employers in America. So again, kudos to the workforce as well. Now let's transition to our new leadership. I believe both Kevin Carroll and Jim Ingle are in the audience. So if you can just raise your hands I, and stand up, please, because I do want everyone to know who you are, because they're definitely going to know you come January. Thank you. And thank you for being here. We've had uh, together, and I think we have two school board members of the new school board coming in, Catherine Haynes and Ryan Harder. I both saw them. If, if they could also stand up. Thank you. Um, I can say, just from our orientations we've had thus far, and, and the discussions I've had with the new school board members coming in, uh, we are working towards creating a great team a great collaborative team of, of five board members, five school board members, 
uh, with my, my personal friend, Dr. Doherty over here, uh, that we are going to try and do our best to work for you, to, uh, to listen to you, as, as was mentioned, and, uh, and again, continue to do great things. Uh, you know, I can unequivocally state, just from the discussions I've had thus far, that uh, the 10 people that we're going to have there in 2020 want to serve you, want to listen to you. Uh, they know their constituents well. And again, we're going to listen to them as staff and as a county administrator, so we try and implement some of their ideas. And Dr. Dari and I are going to both align our leadership teams together to accomplish those great things. As far as serving our community, uh, the picture on your screen here is the front cover of the New York Times. By the way, I can't see what's up there. I'm just trusting that Natalie Spillman helped create this presentation, so I need to give her a shout out and knowing exactly when to flip these slides. So if I'm saying something that's not on the screen, somebody just wave at me. <laughs> But I'm trusting what you see up there right now is um, the front page of the New York Times, the day after the election. And, and for those who don't know what it's like to be a county administrator, when someone texts you and say, hey, you know, you got above the fold of the New York Times the day after the election, uh, especially after 2018 and the long lines we had, uh, my, my heart skipped a beat. Um, you know, what we have done over the last, well, first off, that's a good news picture. It's not a bad news picture, it's just showing the power of the people and power of voting. But it also shows you that Chesterfield County is nationally known, nationally known at least during election days. The state of Virginia is nationally known. The overwhelming attention that we are getting right here in Chesterfield County is overwhelming um, to the point that, if you recall, the State Board of Elections website crashed on election day. You know, they just were not ready for it. The programmers didn't do something right. But once the state election site was crashed, everybody migrated over to the county's website uh, nationally even. Uh, we were getting 26 hits per second. Um, just think about that. Um, actually, I had one candidate who, who called me up that night and said he might have been responsible for five of those hits because he kept trying to do a refresh. Um, but having said that, uh, the Registrar's Office really unprecedentedly invited us in to help us work through 2018 to prepare for 2019. Besides splitting some precincts up to create more space, Schools worked with us in closing schools for the day, more poll books, more poll workers, more customer service type techniques, uh, a better centralized website or promote the vote. They were all created to try and appease and address the crowds. Um, we're gonna have a big crowd 2020, so I'm glad we practiced for that. But again, we're gonna try and be ready for, for that. And we're also gonna try and develop other website portals, quite frankly, that those local people can access. And again, there may be some national websites, State Board of Election websites, but we're not going to be dependent upon just those manners of communication. Pivoting to uh, community enhancement, Dan Cohen, two words. He's the director of community enhancement. I think Dan's in the room too, if he could raise his hand, because he is, you got the worst seat in the house, but thank you for being here. But he has done tremendous things with him and his all-star team of, of employees. They brought life to what the epitome of community enhancement should be. Uh, we rehabbed our first house uh, through the Maggie Walker Land Trust. Quick one-liner on the land trust, it's basically where the trust owns the land. By default, it makes the house more affordable for the owner. When, the, when it comes time to sell that house, hopefully years later, the increased value or equity in the house is both split between the trust and the existing homeowner. So again, a win-win for how you create affordable housing. So much so, the old Ettrick Annex School uh, is uh, the property itself is gonna be positioned tonight to be given to the land trust for them to work through a, a community zoning type process down there to create a more affordable housing product. Uh, they've created an electronic applications for homes and businesses to access our tax exemptions for rehabs and renovations. They've also created a tenant's rights brochure. You would not believe some of the landlords that we have in Chesterfield County, while many, and I'd say the vast majority, are good landlords and mindful of their tenants' needs, there are a few. And again, what's, what's sad is the tenants themselves aren't aware of what their actual rights are under laws, under our own laws, and uh, we're out there to try and remind them of that. We're there to remind the landlords of that as well, but we want to be their advocate for, uh, for those rights that may be infringed upon. Our cleanup efforts, 3,600 homes, 144 tons were disposed of. Much of that to the credit of volunteers. Some of your own companies have helped uh, provide those volunteers for the bulky waste pickups, and we have even more planned in 2020. When you can go into a neighborhood and say, we're here to help you, and clean out everything that you do not want, much of it is debris and other art, odd artifacts that have been in the yard for years, there's something special that a community comes together. So we're not just in there doing it ourselves, 
We're doing it in side by side with the people that live in the community. And there's a pride factor that happens that moment, that day after, that you just can't, you have to see it to, to, to believe it. As far as special area plans, we created the Northern Jefferson Special Area Plan. And I will tell you one thing Chesapeake is going to do and is not just create a plan and stick it on a shelf. It's right there on my desk, on many people's desks, on the mind of board members. We're going to always keep these plans active. So as an example of a, of a major step that we accomplished with this plan just recently was a market area study that really shows you the buying power and the incomes that actually exist in this area that they actually are spending outside of the area. That helps us when we try and recruit business prospects for, uh, to, to come locally down that corridor. Woolridge Road. You know, we plan you know, for development-related road impacts through zonings. Many times it's developer-built roads that help connect two roads together. Uh, Woolridge is a great case study of an example from the old Roseland rezoning, if people remember that name. Part of the zoning case had the requirement for them to connect Woolridge Road from Old 100 over to 288. It's only about one mile wide. It's about a $25 million project. But that one mile may be in eternity if, in fact, this Roseland case is in its current state for, for years to come. The, the development of Roseland may warrant the, case, the road being built, but quite frankly, the people here today warrant that road to be connected. We have the abilities through right away and processes to work with the landowners to best position that, that connection to occur. So what you just see on the screen here is an example of two alignment options that are out there. So we're gonna be working on that in 2020 to hopefully bring that connection. It's, it's, you're right next to 288, and that's a great interchange for, to serve the Woolridge Road traffic. There are 47 other major, major road improvement projects, totaling over 350 million in various stages of planning and construction. So when people say, are you trying to keep up with the roads? You know, we're trying to keep up with $350 million worth. Now, is there more road needs that are out there beyond that? Sure, and, and there always will be. I mentioned, I think a year or two ago, that I read articles in 1917 that said how Chesterfield was behind in roads, and we didn't even have cars back then. Um, <laughs> So again, being innovative and business-minded uh, is, is trying to figure out how we can get these other types of roads done in different approaches than simple waiting for a zoning case to come to life. For the summit, 1,500 residential units. Again, I think I talked about this last year. It might have been just approved in December of 18. $300 million, 1,500 units. It will be the largest continuing care community in Central Virginia. I believe it's going to be twice as large as Westminster Canterbury to give you a perspective of scope. They are actively working right now on further defining project scope and costs. It took them about three years from the zoning to construction for their similar project in Salt Lake City, which is very successful. So again, expect some activity uh, of that in 2021. As far as transportation innovation practice, we use this particular zoning case to, to create the incremental revenue source of the taxes that are gonna be derived from this property to fund the Woolridge Road Connector. This, in essence, is at the end of Woolridge Road, or the farther westernmost point of it, uh, through the Magnolia Green subdivision. So transportation and, and our budgeting folks, together working with Steve Ellswick uh, as a board member, said this would actually be a good rational nexus of taking monies from an impact and putting it directly into something that can serve people here today. For jobs, I keep talking about jobs all the time, and, and it, what's great is that our jobs are growing at 2.6%. In many cases, our jobs are growing faster than our own population, which means the other factor I'm trying to do is get this net export of jobs down lower. We are net exporting about 23,000 jobs a day. So we have about 54,000 waking up and going to work each day here in Chesterfield County. Um, we have another um, 100 or 85,000 people that drive into Chesterfield County every day to take a job here. So we have a lot of jobs already as a base. But what we do lose is about 108,000 people do wake up and travel outside our county for a job. Now having said that, I think that 108,000 is overstated uh, because in that figure are people who telework. You know, their jobs may be listed somewhere else across the river, even Northern Virginia. We even have some teleworkers that never leave Chesterfield whose job may be listed in Iowa, quite frankly, as part of their corporate headquarters. We're trying to understand that better, but there still is a feeling that there's a net export of jobs. So what you see on the map here is actually all the locations for those that uh, uh, live, in, or live, out, live in Chesterfield that work outside of Chesterfield. So again, I'm, I'm hopeful to show that map with less colors outside the county uh, going forward. Nothing personal against those outside the county. As far as businesses, we love for their businesses to be here, but we're also respectful. We're not here to, do, to cherry pick and pull businesses 
from our brothers and sisters across a river. So, but as you know, it goes without saying, having jobs closer to where people live uh, is part of quality of life now. It's being asked for more and more by people, young, medium, and old people. I say medium, I, I don't know what the term is. I'm, I, I can't say millennials anymore because they're starting to get old, actually. Um, <laughs> But you know, just think about yourself. If you work closer to, to, your, to your home, what you do is, is you, know, you work with um, different types of uh, community events. You have hobbies. You, go to, you, know, you might go to your child's school. You get to enjoy those types of activities. You know, I spent 90 minutes in a car yesterday just driving to see a, a nephew's play. So again, just keep that in mind as we're trying to pull things closer. It's not just about the business of it. It's about the quality of life. Collaborating workspaces. You know, again, there's many entities represented in this room uh, that are part of the, the collaborative nature. And, you know, again, we're going to work more and more because that is the beginnings of telework. That's the beginnings of entrepreneurship that, again, hopefully can grow a home and a business uh, here in Chesterfield County. Uh, Gather has their 25,000 square foot uh, location set to open up at Winterfield uh, next year. So, again, that's, an, that's a large scale facility, but I also respect many of the smaller ones here. GRTC. You know, for those that aren't aware, we are creating a route system through a grant. It's 14 different stops, Monday through, Thursday, Monday through Saturday, down the Route 1 corridor. And we look forward to, you know, working with GRTC, working with the community there that filled out the surveys, that said they'd be riding the buses, because we don't want empty buses. Nobody wants to be paying or subsidizing empty buses. We want them full. But we also want to be mindful of what are the other ways that people can go from point A uh, to point B, you know, when they want to and how to get there. Switching over to transportation and trains. This is the old Ettrick train station from the 1950s. It's actually called the Petersburg train station. Uh, we are working with the Department of Rails and Public Transportation. We got a grant for a raised platform to make easier access for them. Um, but we're also working actually trying to renovate that entire property into a new type of train station connected to the community, connect maybe to some more residents and businesses. My personal goal is the next time you see a picture of that train station that looks new, it's actually going to be called the, the Chesterfield Ettrick train station. Uh, until that point in time, nothing personal, but it can, it can keep the name that it has today. Um, engaging with the community. You see a whole host of ways to stay engaged. You know, those that are involved in technology, please use any and all of those manners. Uh, we're here for you. There's so much information we have to share. Uh, quite frankly, our relationships with the business associations, they do try and fact-checked us, they ask us questions, they want our information to be relevant and complete, and we want it to be so. So again, uh, do your homework assignments when you leave here. Simply go onto our homepage and, and subscribe to at least our happenings page. I think there's about 50 social media sites that may be of interest to you. Push it amongst your fellow employees as well, or friends and family. The more you're connected with us, the more you know what we're doing, the more you, quite frankly, then can have us pivot to what you need us to focus on or hold us accountable for what we're otherwise already doing. We have 69,000 people actually we're connected to through Nextdoor, a product, quite frankly, that originated from neighborhoods, and we're actually tapping that market to providing uh, our information out to them. And that's just that's something we started just in the last two to three years. We also want to connect with all of our communities. And again, you see an arrangement here of different ways of the various multicultural nature of our communities. For those that don't know, we were the first one in the region to host an entirely Spanish-speaking Latino police academy where people learned about our police functions. We had a Spanish-speaking budget meeting where all the, the dialogue was in Spanish. Uh, we, had, we were the first ones to create My Chesterfield Academy through the partnership with the Asian Latino uh, Solidarity Alliance, Alliance where we're working with new immigrants or even second-generation people who are trying to get to know what their local government is. They come from places where local government may not even exist, and so we're working with them. Quite frankly, the course, and I've been to it, uh, is something that even existing citizens need to know because we don't necessarily teach local government as much as we used to. Protecting our community, switching back to public safety. You know, the, the strong relationships we have uh, and the work of our officers and our schools through the PALS program, I think actually reached out to 10,000 students uh, since it started. Again, for those that don't know what the Police Athletic League does, it's really simple. It's through their relationship that they try and manage bullying and identify solutions for conflict resolution. Some skills that all children may have learned from their parents, but they may not have. This is what PALS helps to do. The Police Experience Program, winner of the best in state for Virginia Association of Counties, enables us to go right onto the Virginia State campus and meet with the students, have them involved and, and do role playing what it's like to be a police officer. 
It also helps us understand their perspectives of being a student or being a 20-year-old. The relationships have grown so strong, not only was it, the winning an award is just a byproduct, but these students now have become interns. These students are now hopefully applying for our jobs in the police department and other public safety venues. So again, we look forward more and more to doing that. As far as preserving life and uh, protecting the vulnerable, this picture here is worth a thousand words. Actually, it's worth about four million dollars between cash and the drugs you see on the screen. And as Colonel Katz stated, people died as a result of this picture, of the fact that we recovered all of this. No drug kingpin is going to let this go and certainly isn't going to write this off on his taxes. That's from Colonel Katz. And um, so again, there's so many ways in which they're trying to pull this uh, dangerous drug and narcotics off the street. Uh, kudos to them, it's a 24-7 operation. Um, but again, I give them great credit, great employees. So much so, we hired so many great employees 25 years ago, plus they're all were starting to retire in waves. It was too much intelligence leaving us at one time. The Board of Supervisors, to their credit, uh, worked out a program to sort of defer some of those retirements with targeted salary increases and signing bonuses. And I'm proud to say, and, and Colonel Katz would be here even prouder to state, that come next summer, he anticipates to be fully staffed in the police department for the first time in 15 years. Uh, and again, not many police departments can say that in the United States. For the opioids harp topic, again, Carl Leonard, Sheriff Leonard, has done tremendous things with that. Uh, the region, for the first time in my career, actually had a joint campaign uh, for those that uh, may be affiliated with uh, vulnerabilities to drugs, recovery, as well as families that just for the awareness factor. Again, that, that campaign was a, a great success. Uh, I will say the overdoses have declined over the last year from 46 to 35. However, the usage is high and growing. The deployment and availability of Narcan has saved lives, and actually that should be celebrated. But again, the usage of Narcan has almost become commonplace. Our police, fire, and sheriff's office are constantly saving people with Narcan. People themselves are saving themselves with Narcan. We'll get people who call 911 and say, I'm about to do drugs, I have Narcan, my friend has it to try and save me, but just in case, can you show up in 10 minutes? That's what the world is like for some of these drug addicted people. It's a world that we don't know, and I think the more we get to know this, the more that we can figure out what can be the solutions of how we can help. We actually had someone before our drug court uh, overdose in front of the judge about three weeks ago. And again, it was a sheriff's office that deployed Narcan right there in the courtroom to save the person's life. Um, you know, Sheriff has his Helping Addicts Recover program, significant impact to the community. Just one takeaway of how well it works, of how well connected these people are to the program, is that when people are released from the jail, they are feeling vulnerable some days. They still, haven't, they still have their addiction, in essence, for the rest of their lives. They're, they're trying to make decisions not to use drugs, but what they're trying to do is, is be better. Now, their bad influences are still around them. So we've actually had some former inmates knock on the jail door and say, please let me in. I'm feeling vulnerable. I'm feeling threatened. I feel safer in a jail than outside of it. You know, again, that's just trying to put the perspective of this population of how we're trying to work with them and, and figure it out together. Fire AMS, as you can see from this picture, um, you know, again, the buildings have gotten taller and wider. And the, the aerial ladder trucks that they're trying to use and deploy now are helping uh, you know, provide that layer of safety. I will say the Bon Secours ER Center in the Chester area was a very big win for Chesterfield and the hospital system last year, but most importantly for the patients who are now be able to be served by fire EMS quicker because, quite frankly, we were going on long transports and having an ambulance marked out. The ambulance can get someone dropped off quicker. It goes without saying they're ready for the next 911 call sooner. The Magnolia Green Fire Station, again, a, a great example of trying to put a, a need based upon a demand that's arising in a certain area. Again, trying to create a complementary design to the neighborhood that's right next to it. Investing in our community, um, CNBC had Virginia ranked number one for business. I like to think that uh, Chesterfield County was part of that number one ranking for all that we did over the last year. As the screen says up here, there's probably about 10 projects up there, $250 million, 2,000 jobs. Uh, it would not, that screen would not be there if it wasn't for the role of Garrett Hart, his economic development team, and the economic development authority who worked and managed many of those deals through the system. Uh, they also work, as you hopefully know, if you have a business that's expanding or feels like you need to move to another place, uh, they're there for you as well, and that's just as important. I think there's about 9,000 uh, smaller type businesses out there. 
And again, we, we count them just as importantly as we do the larger ones. Carvana, again, made a lot of news over the last month, $25 million, 191,000 square feet, 400 new jobs. Again, the most important part of this, it's a case study for us of, again, how to work with the community, how to have an industrial zone property that the case from yesteryear had very limited site buffers. It had a winding road of trucks going up and down, it appropriately named Woods Edge Road, quite frankly. And it really had some accessibility issues for the neighborhoods to get to the schools, as well as the site distances themselves with the neighborhoods even getting onto the existing road. So how do you take a commercial industrial project, make them go through a process, but use the monies and or the accountability to the site itself to increase the buffers, create a no through trucks for all trucks, not just the ones from this site, create the accessibility to the neighborhoods. It took many months to go through that. I think that we can probably be more proactive in trying to identify those future sites sooner and working with the neighborhoods to understand what is needed so that we can represent their interests for any prospects we may have. Torch, the 1,500-acre uh, parcel has a quite a long history of land uses and names. Some of those names I can't say anymore. They're curse words, I think. Um, but I would like to say that I think we brought closure to this. Uh, this, this energy company of 150 megawatts, 500-acre solar field will be uh, a major um, development for us, but more importantly, if not more importantly, connected to the property on the same site, um, there'll be up to four data centers. Total investment over two billion dollars. What I love about this project, and I've tried to look as many places as I could, I have not seen a data center co-located with a power source that kind of would offset it. You would imagine a lot of these data center companies, they like to say they're sustainable. Well again, their, their solar power may be 50 miles away that they check the box not five feet away. So again, that picture of having a solar field and a data center on the same site is a picture that's going to sell itself. And again, I expect hopefully prospects to arise from it. Cartograph. I use this as an example of what's called our fast track process and the credibility of that. Cartograph is going to be right next to Niagara. In essence, the same site of um, consultants and engineers that were uh, Niagara's uh, winning team that worked with the county to get a building up and up within nine months, that reputation is national. Cartograph has the same site consultants, so when they had this client called Cartograph from Mexico who was interested in a packaging firm, they said, you want to build in Chesterfield County if you need to build it fast and build it right, and so forth. It, I wouldn't say it made our job very easy, but the credibility enabled us to have the conversation quicker than many other localities could ever have such conversation. Shameen Hotels, I see Mike Watkins here representing the Shameen uh, industry. $125 million investment, multiple projects, but what you see is a signature hotel as part of the, a part of it. 10,000 square foot conference center. Nothing personal, Dr. Daugherty, about the CTC whole room here, but I'd love to have this meeting uh, at, at, in a 10,000 square foot facility in about two years. Um, but again, again, dynamic change to the Stonebridge area, dynamic uh, you know, change to the, to the whole corridor of hopefully the Midlothian Turnpike. So the future, though, is now. And again, this, uh, this illustration here of the view of apartments uh, right by Westchester Commons, uh, and, and it's appropriately named, VUE is the name, but John Watkins once told me that you know, from this site, you can actually see the mountains on a clear day. Um, so I want to really get up there on that top floor and take a look myself with Mr. Watkins there. But again, this is just showing why we have traditional ways in which we try and serve people in the communities and that what they define as quality of life. There are many, many more people now who are wanting to have that accessibility, that walking path, if you will, from where they live, to where they work, to where they play, to where they eat. And those venues that are the, the, the play, eat, and work, to the degree that they're also closer to other people that might have a shorter drive, is simply a win-win uh, exercise. Animal adoption facility, this is a game changer as well. You know, we, are, we have defined a location on the map that you see behind me. We're finalizing the, uh, the plans and finalizing the scope with a nonprofit type operator who can hopefully run the facility to give that care and attention that sometimes the nonprofits can do better than a, than a government. And again, what you're, the result will be will probably be one of the most intentional manners for animal adoption in a retail-esque facility with the highest caliber care levels. You know, it's going to even have an adjacent trail system. So just picture it. You know, walking a dog is one of the best things that a dog likes to do all day. It's actually good for the person, I think, walking it. I guarantee you, you take the dog for a walk in this facility and that dog's going to be coming home with you that day. <laughs> Perkinson Art Center. Again, another game changer in the, in the Chester area. It's opening up in October 2020. 
please, as you and your businesses, what you can do is start supporting this. They have a foundation. You, I think for $1,000 you can get your name on a seat. Um, business name, personal name. Buy the tickets when they come for sale because all of that is really going to be what you need to do to sustain something like this. We have positioned it for great success. Bruce Miller, uh, one of the best artistic directors Central Virginia has ever had, is the lead artistic director for this. Uh, and again, I look forward to attending performances there starting next fall. River City, we can't have a state of the county without talking about River City. Uh, just the continued investment in there with additional parking in the rear. Three new backfields and restrooms and concessions also back there, opened by April of 2020. You know, this facility served 146,000 people over the last year. Many state and national tournaments. Many residents as well also enjoy that facility. Economic impact, I think, just of this one property is over $27 million in sports tourism. It is known across the country as one of the best facilities. And it's not just because of the number of fields and the conditions of the fields, it's also the hospitality of the staff that works there and the regional resources of Richmond Regional Tourism, Economic Development, Parks and Rec, and I can go on and on. But it's also you, many of you who have small restaurants and, and, and other hotel type operations, you're that front line as well in making that place a success. We actually opened it up this last year for the first, I believe, national spike ball tournament that was on ESPN. So again, it's not just rectangle fields, it's, it's something for everybody. Mobility. The, the word transportation has different meanings for different audiences. To me, it's all about mobility getting people from place to place in a manner that's suited for them. You know, vehicles are one manner and they will always remain a, a major manner in this area. Uh, you know, you, I talked about the bus transit and train stations. However, mobility also includes sidewalks, trails, and other uh, innovative ways to connect people to where they want to go. We have 19 bike pedestrian projects underway totaling $36 million. A $44 million trail will run from Ashland to Ettrick, and it's in the design phase with 13 of those miles being in Chesterfield County. Some of the segments are easier than others, such as the Torch property I mentioned. We'll have the trail come through it, and there's an old trolley line not too far away. Um, but I will also say that this goal of this trail, too, is to interconnect someday with the Capitol to Capitol Trail. Our Uber-based Access on Demand and Chesterfield Access, some programs I spoke to about last year, uh, for those over 60, disabled or low income, I think is going to have over 75,000 riders this year. And, and I'll just sum up in one message I got two weeks ago, and I'm going to read this from a, a person who tweeted and gave a shout out to Chesterfield. I, I think it's a daughter who was speaking about her mother. Thank you for serving your citizens with mobility needs. My mother can only be transported by a wheelchair van. In past holidays, private services promised to come but didn't show up. Your service through Dependacare was amazing and on time. We value this initiative. Again, that's a good day in government when you get a, uh, a note like that from a citizen. So improving mobility, the private sector mobilities are also welcomed. What you see here on the screen is a picture of Crystal Lakes uh, parking lot. Uh, it's a 700 unit apartment complex. Just recently they deployed uh, through a contract these cars. They're electric cars which the tenants have access to to rent at a very affordable price per minute. The freedom of going where you want to and when is something that cannot be understated. You know, showing the resilience of an individual, uh, we were told by the management company, some of the first uses of how people want to take a car is to take their family to the beach for the first time. Their children have never seen an ocean. They have never seen an ocean. Actually, we have heard in other uh, cities and, and areas where this is program has been done that some people actually rent the cars and become Uber drivers to supplement their income. And their income as an Uber driver is greater than the cost of the rental price. So again, the resilience of the individual of using a car uh, is going to be there, hopefully, for this community. So I look forward to other types of products of mobility that we may be able to do. Water sources. The fourth water source uh, here in the lower Appomattox River is nature's reservoir. We're going to be able to pull 10 million gallons per day from this facility. Again, using nature, the tidal nature of the James River and Appomattox there is really uh, doesn't, doesn't have to involve digging a large hole or trying to secure other properties for it. The, the, the river itself is holding all of that water, fresh water, for us. Very cost effective way of doing it. The fourth water source will also provide that flexibility we need, not just for Chesapeake County, but really the security of the entire region system. Um, you know, again, four water sources is a rarity for any locality, 
Um, and I would also say that it also solidifies our even rarer AAA bond rating of a utility system. Recycling. Later today, the Board of Supervisors is going to be getting the results of its, this regional authority, CBWMA's consultants report on recycling, the future of it, and what are the ways in which localities can best uh, serve its citizens and businesses. Uh, I think what we're going to try and see, possibly, is a way in which we can take the continuum of this authority and the services and the economies of scale of the 79,000 people that use recycling and continue that in the future, but really be making it much more of a fee-based system, that we're just the middleman and what it costs. Right now, that fee, which was set almost 10 years ago, is $25. A break-even fee would be about $36 or so. So again, that's just an example of one option. Also, I think we're going to try and make it you know, more apparent that there are other ways in which people can make decisions for themselves, private sector, convenience centers. You know, we're going to be open and honest with the people who are using such uh, services. Entrepreneur, I mean, environmental stewardship. Um, you know, it's always complicated when we say, you know, we care about the environment, but you've got to go through 40 different websites or 40 different reports to know where we stand on different topics. Some of them confusing, some of them engineer-based reports. We're trying to work on a layman's perspective of trying to put all of our environmental type stewardship topics together as one website, which I've been told is, is just uh, opened up that portal uh, this week. So I encourage all of you to take a look at it, give us feedback on it. What you see here on the screen are just two of our premier uh, ways in which we try and care for the environment, Swift Creek uh, Reservoir. And the one on the other side is the Fallen Creek one. And while not an active reservoir that we use today, um, you can see the silt that's been built up in it, which again affects flooding and stormwater for any minor storm that occurs in the area. The Board of Supervisors, I think, has a $13 million project award for that uh, today, of which $4 million of that is coming from a grant we received to remedy that, that silt issue there and, and restore that reservoir to a better product. We are blessed to have eight workforce and higher ed training providers in Chesterfield County, and I know a few of them are in the audience today. So uh, I congratulate you know, Brian Stratton, Tyler, and, and again, the other six that may be here. So we work with these institutions. We work with them in the schools of trying to define the jobs that are out there, try to define the jobs that are coming so that we can have a workforce prepared, we can have students prepared for such careers if they choose so. So uh, you know, with that said, you can just tell by the investment of Tyler on the screen. I think it's a $24 million investment into the Tally Center. And again, that's an amazing addition, helping prepare the students for the workforce. Old Hundred Elementary School. You know, this is an example of one of the schools that we opened up in the last year. Um, but I will tell you, the Enon and Beulah openings were even uh, more grand, only because that was a replacement of an existing school. And what I suggest is everybody should have on their bucket list to go visit a new school opening, um, especially one that's been a renovated one or a replacement one. What you see is a child, a teacher, a uh, parent and a grandparent celebrating, you know, remembering, and just so excited that they feel as though the government is, is doubling down in that area to make a difference uh, to the children. Uh, so the stories that are told, the tears that are shed, are, are again, it's just something to behold, to, to witness. And again, we look forward to doing more of those types of openings uh, over the next year as we have uh, many more uh, elementary schools on the horizon. Uh, you know, and it, that's Metallica, Harrogate, Ettrick, Reams, and Crestwood. Um, so again, please try and attend a new school opening. Whether or not you have a child in it, it's just a sense of community coming together. Speaking of the schools, we had a very successful bond referendum in 2013. We've tra kept track of this. This is an excerpt from our budget and brief of it. We are really now at the end of those projects and we have defined with the schools and as well as the county uh, you know, other projects that are referendum worthy. Uh, that's a topic for the 2020 Board of Supervisors working with the school board to define and again, how best to, to capture if, if in fact 2020 is the referendum year for such projects. Um, you know, I know we're working tremendously with the schools also in just again, forecasting our demands upon our system, students and, um, and people. As far as school performance, I wanna thank Dr. Doherty. I mean, 100% accredited school system is very rare for such a large school system, uh, and especially ones with varying demographic and socioeconomic conditions. Uh, for those that don't know, 38% of our students are on free and reduced lunch, and 18% of our students uh, have English as their second language. So with those factors and facts, if you will, those, those ways in which we teach and which we cater to try and have a student succeed are, are also contributing in a manner that produces the 100% factor. 
Uh, Dr. Dari and I are also sharing one common objective, and, and that's the third grade reading level. The test scores of that, I think, are in the mid-70s. Uh, it goes without saying, if a child does not learn how to read, they can no longer have, you know, read to learn. Uh, and they, they are behind, not just in third grade, but they, they actually have statistics that they drop out far more often. They're less uh, income producing or, or self-sustaining for their families. Uh, they might actually get in more trouble with the law. And it's not just for them that we want to position them to be better off. It's really for them and their succeeding generations. So the more we can collaborate on that topic, it's not easy. We do need your help because there's volunteer roles in that as well. As I'm getting closer to the end of this, our procurement system I mentioned before, and there's a lot of data on this, but we changed our thresholds and policies in working with the business associations to call local for quotes more often, and the initial results are very positive. We had a 24% increase in local vendor purchases, meaning that you were the people we called first and we were able to contract with. Uh, I think it's over $30 million in types of local purchases. Still maybe not where I necessarily want it to, to be, but it's getting to where I think we all can be honest as saying, if we're buying a good and service outside this area, it must be because somebody is making it outside the area and not making it here, and we need to work on how to get those businesses uh, here. Virginia State University and a 6,000 seat uh, you know, center there, again, is getting such attractions as Bob Dylan and, and championship wrestling, something that you would not have thought about just three years ago or so when it was opening up. Continue to work with them, continue to promote it. I encourage all of you to also go to such things. And then as I kind of did last year, my little way to, to end this is, is my little holiday wish list, trying to make things easier for you to make those purchases, those late minute purchases, which I tend to do. Um, so you see right on there, you know, two things are events before Christmas that just get you in the spirit. The Tacky Light Run Tour, uh, I believe is this Saturday, and then Chris, Charlie Brown's Christmas Show is at Virginia State University. Uh, again, both uh, things you should think about doing. Um, just as I did last year, you know, there's some other things that you can give to, and some of it's your time. There's a lot of nonprofits in the room. I think Chris Adani is even here with Chasm. Again, so many ways in which you can give your time that can benefit uh, somebody else. Or simply Google Chesterfield Volunteer. I even tried it myself. Uh, you know, we have a website for the government, but there's also many other manners we pivot you to nonprofits. On the screen here, too, just a couple of other ideas that I just want to promote and give shout outs to. Lifelong Learning Institute, I think for $150 a year, you can take as many courses as you want uh, for anyone who's over the age of 50. Now, I will say, I was planning on buying this as a gift for my wife when she turned 50, but was advised that's not how you start your wife's birthday at age 50. Um, so, but as a little secret, um, I'm gonna buy for her as a Christmas present, so don't, don't, don't tell anybody. So, the other thing is, you know, you know, you're showing your age when, you know, she's reciprocating back to me. She actually bought me pickleball rackets and balls, because I kept talking about how we were the pickleball capital of the world, so she said, prove it. So, we actually, you know, if you've never played it, you can't help but have fun playing pickleball. I mean, you get some exercise in there, but, you know, I took my two sons out with us, and uh, we probably laughed as hard as we could on the way in which we were trying to play that, that sport. It's not as easy as you think it is, and it's not as slow as you think it is. Um, Parks and library programs, sign up for them. Give that as a gift. There's so many things you can do individually, together with family and friends. Um, you know, if you really want to go for it, take, take our Government Citizens Academy. That's a free gift. Stick that under the tree, an application to take that. Uh, the power of knowledge in your local government is a power that I'd love for everybody to have. And then finally, you know, the uh, animal adoption. You know, that dog I was told even this morning is still available for, for anyone who wants to take it, take it home for them. Um, so please do so. I would like to, before, my last sentence would be is just, you know, thanks to everybody. I do want to give a special recognition to uh, the four deputy county administrators that are, that are all in the room. Um, you know, my job is made so much more easier because the four of them do their job uh, so well and they work together so well. So, uh, sorry to rush through everything. I just had so much to share in such a short period of time, but uh, I just wanted to get it all out there for you. So thank you very much.